Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, now officially uh, 12.04 p.m., which is the official start time for noon conferences. Uh, my name is Peter Angelos. For those of you who I don't know, um, it's a, a pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, first of the uh, 42nd annual uh, interdisciplinary lecture series of the McLean Center. Um, this is something that uh, my predecessor as the director of the McLean Center, Dr. Mark Siegler, started, um, as I said, uh, 42 years ago. And uh, so this is uh, now, you know, multiple iterations. Um, I want to express uh, uh, thanks to the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence um, that helped uh, support the lunch today, which I hope you're enjoying. Um, just uh, fair disclosure, there won't be a lunch every Wednesday. And so uh, it'll be selectively uh, during the course of the year. Um, we will have a, a full uh, lineup of um, speakers uh, throughout the year, and hopefully I'll have, we'll be getting the entire series out to you soon. Um, but just uh, a special note to that next Wednesday, um, the speaker will be uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Weinstein, who's the Senior Vice President for Microsoft Health, who will be speaking about the ethics of AI, moral implications for society. Uh, so uh, today, it really is a true pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, and introduce my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Shola Olapati. Um, uh, a couple words of introduction for those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Olapati. He is a professor of medicine and dean for academic affairs in the biological sciences and Pritzker. Um, Dr. Olapati completed medical school at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, a residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, and a fellowship training in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Olapati rose to tenured professor at the University of Illinois, where he directed clinical research in the section of pulmonary and critical care and sleep medicine for 19 years. Uh, he joined the faculty here at the University of Chicago in 2009 uh, to provide leadership in the Department uh, of uh, a Global Health Program, uh, which has been uh, successful uh, and expanded from a Department of Medicine-based program to a university-based program. Um, and he uh, completed his clinical ethics fellowship training at the McLean Center in 2011. Um, he's focused uh, his research on global research ethics, um, the responsible conduct of uh, research. Um, Dr. Alapati is an environmental scientist who early on recognized the potential health risks of exposure to household air pollution, uh, which was an under-recognized global health issue. Um, his scientific research in Nigeria from 2012 to 2015 was the first to explore the potential health benefits of transitioning pregnant women from cooking with polluting fuels to clean fuels. Um, and I'm sure he will share that and other um, important things with us today. Um, Dr. Olapati's um, talk today is developing a global state of mind a journey from the lungs to the placenta and early childhood development. Um, so join me in uh, virtually welcoming Dr. Olapati, who unfortunately um, can't be with us due to illness. Shola, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. I'm going to share my screen if I could make this work. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I was so looking forward to being able to <clears throat> do this in uh, person, but I was heading home yesterday. I wasn't sure whether my allergies were <clears throat> acting up or whether I had a cold. <clears throat> Knowing that we live in COVID times, I just said, why don't I just check it? And um, 
uh, it was positive. So that's why I'm home and doing this uh, virtually, but I actually feel um, okay. So what I'm gonna be talking about, uh, like uh, Peter said, is looking at um, uh, what I've done over the past uh, 20 years and put it in, in context of the training that I got at uh, McLean uh, Center. And um, so that I don't forget to thank uh, uh, the people who have been generous in uh, funding this work, I wanted to uh, get this out of the way up front. Uh, Richard and Susan Kippert Family Foundation, the United Nations, and then uh, all the NIA for the multiple uh, grants that have supported uh, uh, this work. And I know that uh, Susan Kippert was supposed to be in attendance. She might be online. I can't thank her enough. Um, uh, she and her family for the generosity to my research uh, program and also to the Global Health uh, Program at the University of Chicago. What I'm going to uh, try to accomplish today is to uh, make sure that we, uh, people who don't know yet, um, uh, understand um, uh, one of the most underestimated threat to human health and life expectancy, and uh, to also understand the unlimited possibilities of a global uh, state of mind. And uh, what I'm going to try to do this through this presentation is to weave it through uh, privilege, um, altruism, uh, serendipity or luck, equity, autonomy, justice, and utilitarian, uh, utilitarianism, uh, which is an idea that tries to maximize uh, common good, which is what I've tried to do with uh, my career uh, consistently. You know, I've um, uh, those who went to medical school uh, in this country know that post uh, graduation, you have tons and tons of uh, loans. Um, um, uh, I was uh, privileged, just like uh, Fumi, who is uh, in the upper corner here. We were classmates in medical school before we came to the United States. Um, we went to this uh, wonderful uh, institution for free. We didn't pay anything. We had no loans. Uh, so um, uh, that has given us um, an incredible opportunity to, do in, uh, to be in a good position. And uh, since our young faculty days, we've always looked for opportunity to uh, give back. Uh, so this might be the major driver of why global health has been such an important uh, component of our academic areas uh, for the past uh, uh, two decades. When I was a young um, kid, I grew up in a setting where I learned that charity begins uh, at home. As a young um, uh, faculty at the University of uh, Illinois on the south side of Chicago, where my clinical and research work at that time focused on, on asthma. I was um, uh, intrigued by the fact that um, on the south side of Chicago, um, a lot of African-American uh, patients that I saw had terrible asthma, whereas in reflecting on my education in medical school, we didn't see that much asthma. So uh, based on that and um, the idea that I got a free ride from that medical school, wanted to go to Nigeria to test um, uh, the hygiene uh, hypothesis, its relationship to, uh, to asthma. This was way before everybody started talking about the microbiome. And the hygiene hypothesis, for those uh, who may not know, presupposes that if you grow up, in a setting where you are exposed to a um, clean environment, you get vaccines, everything is clean. Uh, there's little for your immune system to do because there's no infection to fight. So that's usually uh, simplistically an overexpression of your Th2 phenotype, which is more allergic. And that pretty much, uh, if you do a skin test, you'll see that individuals who have that kind of clean existence are the ones who are going to develop 
asthma or any other uh, atopy related uh, conditions. By contrast, uh, kids who grew up in settings similar to uh, what I, uh, where I grew up, where we played in the sand, we, if you are, you are eating and your food drops, you picked it up and you, you add it. You didn't even give it any 30 seconds. You picked it up and add it. And I remember uh, also in uh, school, when we were in um, uh, lower school, uh, we, they would come to school and periodically give us some of these deworming pills. Everybody took it. They just gave it to everybody that was in school because helminthic infections were very, very uh, uh, prevalent at that time. And um, it's a very potent stimulation of the immune system and the TH2, which you would expect to be an allergic phenotype. But if you if you do the allergy test and you'll find out that these kids would be seropositive for allergens, but then they would not um, um, uh, develop uh, much uh, by way of allergic diseases. As a religious person, the way I looked at it is uh, people have a uh, life that's bad enough with helminthic infection. Why would the good Lord punish them with uh, asthma or allergic diseases? And if you look at it, uh, uh, this blockage here, uh, there are many factors, but IL-10 seems to just block the expression of some of this uh, allergic phenotype. Uh, so I was curious um, uh, that um, uh, that would be, um, uh, that was what was happening. So we went in there, we collected blood samples, uh, we uh, extracted DNA, uh, looked at uh, biomarkers of inflammation, CRP, did everything we could do. And uh, also uh, went inside some of the homes to collect dust samples to identify some of the environmental allergens that may be at play uh, with the manifestation of, uh, of asthma. The long and short of it was we did find out that hygiene hypothesis really does exist if you get exposed to uh, a dirty environment or even in this side of the world, uh, if you get uh, exposed to farm settings, uh, we can see, we know that uh, that kind of early exposure sort of prevents um, or reduces the risk of uh, developing asthma. Uh, but the slide that I'm putting up here just reflects the potential opportunities to do global health. Uh, because uh, little did I know at that time that the DNA that I extracted from my asthmatics in Nigeria would be the default DNA for um, uh, the Kappa Consortium, which is a consortium trying to look for the gene for asthma in people of, um, um, of uh, African ancestry. So um, uh, the DNA from the Nigerian asthmatics was compared to African Americans uh, in in um, in the U.S., different countries. I mean, different states uh, from West Indies, from Brazil, and from wherever. Every I mean, black people who are taken uh, for slave trade, and you can see that it's been very very impressive because a lot of these publications are in uh, Nature Communications in Nature Genetics. But I'm just going to flag this particular. Oh boy, this is what happens when you're at home. I'm going to flag this particular this particular uh, assembly of pan genome from deep sequencing of nine, ten humans of Af African descent. This study showed that the um, DNA from people of African descent that was uh, the default had ten percent more DNA than any. Um, uh, DNA that's in any um, uh, uh, library that we know about. Um, uh, this kind of uh, opportunity opens up possibilities to find uh, founder mutations uh, that may be of uh, interest to uh, understanding uh, other diseases, uh, because I know in some parts of Africa, people have very, very strong bones. For example, we have a lot of problems with osteoporosis here. Um, uh, similarly, people who live in the desert there, 
they have significant uh, adaptation in their sodium chloride channel. So there's plenty of opportunity to actually find um, uh, incredible uh, scholarly output uh, from um, uh, being open-minded to doing work globally. And one of the observations uh, uh, from the Kappa Consortium, this is a work that's actually under review, is that we've been able to identify um, um, uh, using uh, nasal epithelium, we've been able to look at, identify sites of dysregulation for asthma risk that drives increase in TH2 inflammation, which is what atopy is, decreased capacity for wound healing and impaired drug response. And this may play uh, you know, a very important role in the understanding of asthma within African diaspora. And I'm sure if uh, Fumi were here, sitting here, doing her own presentation, she could say the same thing for the incredible work that she's uh, done in Nigeria and in Africa, looking at breast cancer uh, in people of African ancestry and comparing them to uh, African-Americans on the south side of Chicago. So this uh, opportunity to just think globally has been very, very important and influential in some of the work um, uh, that I've done over the past uh, two decades. So in doing the hygiene hypothesis work um, um, and trying to get inside the homes to collect dust samples, this was the site that we found. Uh, you can see the people cooking in uh, what one might even consider primitive ways uh, with firewood. And you could see the walls. The walls are just black. And uh, with um, a lot of um, uh, pollution inside the homes. And you can imagine as a, a pulmonary person, I was just alarmed. And the question was, I went in there looking for atopy. The question was, um, is it really atopy, uh, asthma, or could this just be oxidative uh, stress from uh, being exposed and inhaling all of these toxic uh, uh, pollutants? So I came back because I had no idea how bad that kind of uh, site was. And in looking at the global burden of disease, the shocker was uh, when you look at ambient particulate exposure and household air pollution exposure, he accounted for number four and number five causes of the global burden of disease in 1990 ranking. By 2015, um, uh, actually, after I started doing this work, you can see that ambient air pollution is still number five, with household air pollution still holding a significant number 10. I had no idea it was this bad when I was um, uh, in Nigeria, but this uh, observation uh, has been uh, the uh, fork in the road that's driven my uh, academic um, uh, career while still doing the uh, asthma work. And I'm going to share some of uh, this work uh, today, thinking about it from the uh, equity and justice uh, uh, perspective. If you look at uh, uh, exposure to air pollution, ambient air pollution, this accounts for at least uh, 3 million preventable deaths every year. And if you add the mortality or disability related to exposure indoors, it accounts for, which accounts for another 2.9 million preventable mortality every year. That's about 7 million premature deaths every year. And uh, I had no idea it was that bad. And I don't know how many of you are tuned into the challenges of uh, pollution related exposure, uh, but I, it caught my uh, attention. And if you look at uh, places where this is the biggest problem, if you look at India, uh, it accounts for about 920,000 deaths every year, the ambient exposure. If you add the indoor component, another 590,000 preventable mortality. Look, look at China, it's almost uh, 2 million people, both uh, from the indoor and the ambient uh, exposure. Uh, this is uh, this was something that was really difficult to walk away from. And if you look at uh, Africa or the most 
affected countries in the world. If you look at Nigeria right here, about 125 million people, 75% of the population, cook with uh, unclean fuel. And this accounts for 70,000 premature deaths every year. In Ghana, it's about 13,000 every year. Guatemala, 5,000. These are preventable deaths. And the common string for a lot of this bottom billion uh, population is that they, they have uh, energy poverty and don't have access to clean cooking fuel. Uh, you can just um, um, uh, turn on the light and uh, it goes on just like we do here. And this is data from uh, our colleague um, uh, in the business school or the uh, uh, Milken Institute. Uh, you can see here PM related uh, mortality um, uh, when you look at life years lost. It's about 2.3 years relative to tobacco. And all I want you to also pay attention to some of the more topical uh, diseases. I don't want to underplay their importance, but if you look at HIV, on safe water and sanitation, even alcohol, they pale next to the mortality and the morbidity associated with uh, particulate matter uh, exposure. And what was most bothersome to me is that women and children who are less than five years of age bear the brunt of the mortality related to the indoor pollution from uh, uh, cooking with uh, unclean fuel inside the homes. If you look at uh, the energy ladder, or what I call the energy poverty in terms of what people actually cook with, if you look at high income countries, you can see we have access to electricity, gas, LPG, ethanol, and methanol. I want you to look at the extreme, the very low income. Uh, uh, they cook with crop waste. Any dry drug, uh, crop waste is and dunk is uh, what people cook with. Low income, it's a combination of that, wood and charcoal. I didn't know what cooking with uh, dung was until I went to Bangladesh with one of our colleagues here, uh, Habib, in public health sciences. What you see here is what people cook with. And uh, what you see is dung or cow shit being wrapped around um, uh, sticks of wood. Sometimes they put it on the back of trees so that when it dries up, this is what people cook with. And, and it, it's so disturbing in that they say, why is the exposure so dangerous to women and children? They say picture is worth more than a million words. You can see the intimate proximity while cooking with these little guys in the backs of their moms. So little uh, so this makes it very clear why women and little children are the most susceptible uh, to the um, mortality and morbidity related to exposure to household air pollution uh, because of energy uh, poverty. And it doesn't matter whether you go to India or Bangladesh, poor people all over the world, they have the same pattern. And... Um, uh, but if we don't know about it, if we don't bring it to anybody's attention, nobody would know because we are so far removed from all of these uh, challenges uh, through the privilege that we all uh, uh, enjoy. So and when they talk about autonomy or community engagement and participatory research, uh, haven't been alarmed by that observation I wanted to work in one of the semi-urban um, uh, or rural setting in Nigeria. And the first thing uh, that I did was, you know, went to some of these uh, communities, you can still I see, had here on my head at that time, just to talk to them about some of these challenges and to let them know that we were interested in coming to explore how bad um, uh, it is and whether we could work together to uh, protect uh, them. And they were all alarmed because they had no idea. I mean, women were just there doing what women um, do for their families, cooking meals to keep their family um, alive and well. Little did they know that it was causing so much of the health problems that they had. And I recommend community engaged and participatory research for anyone because uh, not only did they come up with ideas that made 
doing our work in this community very, uh, very uh, successful. Um, uh, they also uh, participated in the in the research willingly, and uh, each time we've had to go back, um, uh, they welcome us uh, uh, gladly because they know that we have their interest um, at heart. Because if we're not there, paying attention to it, nobody was doing it. So um, um, at that time, uh, the American College of Chess Physicians, they started this uh, humanitarian award. Of course, uh, they wanted to uh, fund people who had ideas of what to do with $25,000. And of course, I showed up and they gave me $25,000. Uh, to go and look into uh, um, uh, this uh, problem that I just uh, identified. On the right side is the rocket stove. I think at that time, before people knew how important this was, this problem was, this was about a $5 stove. And it's a stove that is lined with ceramic so that people could still cook with the firewood uh, that they usually cook with. Uh, and uh, because it's lined with ceramic, it can heat to such high temperatures and theoretically reduce the um, uh, uh, pollutants coming from it. What I, we, I'm showing here on the left side is we looked at particulate matter levels um, at baseline before people started cooking and one hour into the peak of cooking. And when you look on this side, this is 5,000 p.m. 2.5, 5,000. And the WHO standard is supposed to be less than 25. In fact, it's getting closer to 10 for someone to get um, a benefit from it. And what I want to point your attention to is that even before they start cooking, the PM level is already above the WHO standard, meaning that the circulation in those homes are so terrible that there is stagnation and puppet perpetuation of the indoor exposure, even when they're not cooking. And uh, this was what we uh, did um, uh, uh, at the peak of cooking. And then when I introduced this stove for them, um, uh, it uh, created near complete combustion, but you can see that there was a significant improvement in the indoor air quality, but with the mean still above 125, that's more than five times the, the WHO standard, it was still unacceptable, even though we had improved the indoor air quality. On this side is the carbon monoxide level. It gives you an idea of the tolerance of the human uh, body to tolerate. I don't know that anybody would get exposed to this kind of carbon monoxide and not be dead, but you can see how high the carbon monoxide level was uh, um, uh, before and after the introduction of this uh, um, uh, rocket uh, stove. So that made made us feel very good, at least that we were improving the indoor air quality uh, in this um, um, in these uh, homes. The other thing that we did, excuse me, as a pulmonologist, uh, was we looked at the mothers and children who were um, uh, older than six years old and did um, uh, pulmonary function spirometry in them. Nigerian women don't; most African women don't smoke. And if you look at it in the women, uh, almost 40% of them had mild to moderate obstruction. And in the children, almost about 40% of them also had obstruction because you could see from the picture, they had such intimate exposure to pollutants coming from the uh, cooking with unclean, uh, unclean uh, fuel. And if you look at uh, a dose response curve, uh, looking at uh, hub zone, uh, which is really quite high, uh, and you look at what we were able to accomplish by pulling this down to 125, you can see that we really, really were just at the top of the iceberg because people were still gonna, are still going to be subject to exposure that's going to have significant uh, health uh, consequences. In looking further, uh, in Nigeria, where I was going to focus uh, continuation of this work. This is uh, what the map of Nigeria is. And if you look at the prevalence of cooking with unclean fuel, mostly firewood, you can see that most of the northern and northeast Nigeria, that's what 
75 to 80 percent of the population cook with and they have indoor experience similar to the one that i just uh, showed you uh, if you looked at the uh, prevalence or incidence of adverse birth outcomes you can see a near parallel uh, between where people cook with unclean fuel and the high prevalence of adverse birth outcomes uh, uh, meaning still births, premature and low birth weight. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I was curious uh, with respect to what is the mechanism driving this mortality that's so high? And um, thanks, um, um, one of our uh, my illustrious uh, colleagues, yeah, Gokan Mutlu, um, um, which done exactly the kind of work that I was looking for to understand uh, what was going on. He had an animal lab setting where he was able to expose people to filtered air and particulate matter air. Um, I don't know where he got this from, Germany or something, uh, that they sell air, a German air. Or, um, uh, anyway, he was able to expose all of these animals to... Uh, either filtered air and uh, did some elegant studies to demonstrate that exposure to household air pollution creates a prothrombotic state. If you look at bleeding time, uh, partial thromboplastin time, and also uh, platelet count, you can see the control exposure to filtered air and to particulate matter. And you can see consistency that exposure to uh, particulate matter was terrible. Uh, the other thing that was striking to me was that they looked at time to loss of blood flow um, uh, in the coronaries. And you can see here that within a short period of time, uh, the prothrombotic state was able to compromise blood flow. Um, and uh, lest you think that this is just a laboratory experience experiment, this is a study that was done in Europe. I don't know how they got permission to do this. Uh, but they looked at uh, 20 uh, men with stable coronary artery disease, some of them who had actually undergone coronary bypass, and they ex ex uh, exposed them to diesel exist to the level of 300, um, 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 300 microgram per meter squared of particulate matter and exposed them to filtered air and the diesel exhaust. And then um, I, um, I got them on this, do, did a stress test. And what you are looking at here is um, during um, uh, exercise, you expect the heart rate, of course, to go up. And look at the ST segment depression um, uh, during uh, exposure to filtered clean air and uh, to uh, diesel exhaust, uh, suggesting that the exposure to uh, polluted air actually has a more immediate impact. In fact, the cardiovascular sequelae of exposure to household air pollution is a major um, uh, cause of um, uh, mortality and mor morbidity. And for those of you who are historian, if you remember what happened to the coal inversion in the United Kingdom in 1952, about 4,000 people died uh, within about 10 days when the PM uh, 2.5 level rose to almost 1,000. Uh, a lot of them were asthmatics, but a significant uh, proportion were cardiovascular related. With this in mind, I was uh, I wanted to know what it would be like to actually do a randomized control study to uh, transition people from uh, cooking with this firewood or kerosene. Kerosene is a bad fuel, but it was also being subsidized by the Nigerian government. So subsidizing on clean fuel with adverse uh, health outcome, at least uh, from our hypothesis generation I idea, and giving them this uh, uh, incredibly nice um, stainless steel uh, stove uh, with ethanol, which is similar to what people who are rich cook with um, on their boat. Um, uh, so the idea was we would uh, uh, do this intervention and uh, try to see whether we could um, um, look at uh, pregnancy outcome in uh, in this uh, group of women. This slide looks complicated, but pretty much what we did was we 
randomized pregnant women uh, in the 16th to 19th week of pregnancy into uh, continuing to uh, uh, into either uh, a clean uh, ethanol uh, stove or they continue cooking with either firewood or kerosene. And uh, we did um, uh, personal exposure monitoring where they carried this um, 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 uh, very expensive uh, monitor for about 72 hours. We also had a GPS uh, monitor in there so that we could tell uh, exposure ambient from indoor exposure. And then we did ultrasound six times during the pregnancy so that we could track intrauterine growth and uh, did a lot of uh, cytokine and uh, oxidative stress uh, biomarkers, uh, including blood pressure monitoring so that we could look at uh, the impact of exposure um, 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 or this intervention on birth outcome. Uh, halfway through the study, we also thought Wait a minute, why can't we just look at the cord blood to look at, uh, to be able to look at angiogenesis uh, and uh, hypoxia since uh, exposure is supposed to be prothrombotic. We were interested in looking, taking a quick, a good look at the placenta. Uh, but that's exactly uh, what we did. Uh, because of time limitation, we've published all of this work, but higher levels of uh, exposure to PM 2.5 um, uh, accounted for more preterm, significantly more preterm deliveries, miscarriages, and stillbirths, reduced uh, gestational age at uh, delivery, smaller newborns, but not statistically significant. More disturbing was the fact that we were able to see histologic evidence of uh, hypoxia in the placenta. Um, um, and when we looked at uh, biomarkers, we could also see increased level of hypoxia inducing factor, meaning that these children were actually developing in a hypoxic setting with the body trying to generate more oxygen um, uh, capacity. When we looked at the placenta cord blood, we also saw dysregulated placenta angiogenesis where angiogenesis almost persisted towards delivery in an attempt to um, uh, negate the uh, uh, placenta hypoxia. We were also able to show, see that TNF alpha was elevated from Dr. Mutlu's work. Um, he found out that IL 6 uh, was a major driver of this, and it's TNF alpha actually upregulates the production of IL 6. So everything was just consistent with some of the observation and the work that Gokan did in the lab. And uh, more interestingly, um, um, the development of gestational hypertension. Those that were in the F, in the kerosene or firewood group developed hypertension more than those in the control group. And without doing any other intervention with similar levels of uh, uh, blood pressure at enrollment, uh, people in the intervention group actually had a significant drop in uh, diastolic uh, blood pressure and if you put it in the context of uh, hypertensive changes in uh, pregnancy, this is uh, really um, another uh, unanticipated uh, benefit. This is just showing here that if you look at people who are cooking with kerosene, 6.4% of them develop hypertension relative to a smaller number in ethanol users. Similarly, kerosene was a major driver of some of these hypertensive changes and preeclampsia being a major, major uh, uh, concern in low uh, to middle income uh, uh, countries. So because of the work that we, um, um, uh, what we found with respect to the placenta, we were really intrigued and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, this is just uh, what I'm showing you here. <laughs> Histologically, when you want to define hypoxia in the placenta, you look for hot fire cells, chronic vascular density, and CCTL knots. Um, uh, Galena in um, um, Fumi's lab was very helpful in helping us to look at this um, uh, histologically in the placenta. Group C here um, is a group of African-American women, uh, thanks to uh, 
uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Sarosh Reina, who had placenta in African-American women that I was interested in comparing to Nigerian women. What you see here is significant increase in sensitivity or not, reflecting um, uh, placenta uh, hypoxia. Uh, this is in the uh, unclean group. This is in the ethanol group. This is in African-American women who ordinarily shouldn't have any reason to, to have indoor um, uh, exposure, but I'll tell you uh, later, close to the end, why people on the South side and African-Americans are, are unknowingly causing household air pollution, uh, even though they have access to the cleanest of well. So any of the parameters that we looked at, we demonstrated the presence of hypoxia. And by looking at some of this sophisticated staining, you can see that the more exposed um, uh, uh, the mothers were, these are electron microscopic um, um, uh, work, we could see increased uh, expression of hypoxia inducing factor. Uh, so having demonstrated the benefit of this uh, intervention, I mean, we talk about ethics, if people benefit from the intervention, what do you do to the control group? Luckily, we were able to actually ensure that all of the people who were in the control group haven't, under, um, haven't observed that it was beneficial. We gave the, this $60 stuff to everyone. And 81% uh, of the participants on their own chose to adopt cooking and to start paying for ethanol. But the reasons they chose to adopt the uh, ethanol had nothing to some of the medical uh, reasons we were doing the research. They did so because this is a stove that made them feel as if they were in a higher socioeconomic class. It will last for about eight years instead of changing their regular stove every year. Uh, it also made them less um, uh, smell less of, uh, um, um, of smoke after cooking in addition to the fact that it allowed some of their children to stay with them while cooking. And Shell that gave us the ethanol that we used for this study, um, uh, to, my, to my joy, decided to do a commercial pilot of clean cook stove and ethanol in Lagos. Meaning that if we demonstrated that this thing was as good as it is uh, to women and to protect developing children, they wanted to see how they could create a business environment in Lagos to make this available to uh, people so that they don't cook with unclean fuel. What does the future hold for these uh, children? I mean, I mean, I mean, an adult pulmonologist, but the more I look into some of these challenges, I then found myself in the placenta and also working with uh, young uh, children. What we decided to do is since we had this child cohort, we have followed this same cohort of children, about 200 of them for the past uh, nine years. And what we're currently uh, doing, uh, this is work that's funded by the NIH, NIEHS. We are looking at these children, looking at um, uh, current exposure, whether they're in settings where they're still using polluting uh, uh, cooking in the household or clean fuel and uh, monitoring their personal exposure, uh, personal exposure outside the, so that they carry this monitor customized for little kids to be able to carry them around. And so that we can have an idea of what they're exposed to. We also have data on indoor exposure and the ambient uh, uh, exposure. And what we decided to do is we were going to look at um, 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 we were going to look at <coughs> cognitive development in early childhood to see whether the in utero exposure to the hypoxic setting has implications for the growth and development of this uh, of these uh, children. So what we ended up doing is. We working with uh, some of our colleagues, and I need to give uh, Michael himself from the Department of Pediatrics uh, credit and uh, Susan Duncan 
who are part of my research team. We decided we were going to do the use the Kaufman assessment battery for children to um, investigate um, uh, sequential processing abilities, knowledge, learning ability, and planning ability, and to use the Vinland adaptive behavior scales to test communication, daily living skills, socialization, and, and motor skills in this uh, cohort of children that we have. And the results are very sobering again too, uh, but uh, uh, motivates us to keep looking for ways of making this problem go away. So in this simple little cohort, uh, this is just looking at preliminary where we are in looking at almost 200 of these children that we've followed now for almost eight years. We have about 132 from households that are using clean stoves and 66 children from households using polluting cookstoves. And peak indoor levels were higher in households with polluting wells, as we would expect. And we used a multiple linear regression to um, uh, look at the uh, differences, uh, I mean, to association between the exposures and neurocognitive uh, ability while correcting for all of these uh, uh, factors. I'll show you the result, which is really very elegant, but very disturbing. We found if we retract to the KPC, I'm sure I hope the pediatricians who know more than I do understand with the implications of this. A twofold increase in peak personal PM exposure was associated with a significant 3.9 unit reduction in KBC2. When we looked at the uh, mean PM uh, exposure too, you can see this inverse relationship, meaning that the uh, in utero exposure and continued exposure of these children means that they're not gonna be super smart um, uh, down the road. And if you look at the other instrument, it's the same thing. If you look at peak indoor level, a two-fold two increase was associated with a significant reduction in uh, the VAB score. Similarly, when we look at the peak personal exposure, this one did not reach statistical significance, but the trend is quite obvious. And the message is true that if you if kids are exposed to this level of pollut pollution early in life, um, uh, it has implications for their cognitive uh, uh, de uh, development. And when we related this to the kind of stove that they were using, you can see that those that were using clean stove had um, a slightly higher score, while those that are polluting a little worse. And you have to put this in the context that ambient exposure in Nigeria is also quite high. Uh, so even though we're trying the best that we can do indoors, the ambient exposure continues to be a challenge. So the our conclusion is that HAP exposure early in life may be associated with decrements in child neurocognitive development, and the stove type affects neurocognitive outcome. And uh, this is the first study to look at this in a really rigorous manner. But then, what next? Are we just going to fold our, our arms and publish and then walk away? No, we have another R01 that's allowing us to look and an implementation science strategy, working with the Lagos uh, state government in about 32 local government communities to use uh, an implementation science approach to look at exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment to see how we can actually create an ecosystem where people can come in and create a business around making ethanol available, or making some of these clean cook stoves uh, available. And uh, we're in the second year of uh, working uh, this program. And the idea is that hopefully we can encourage as many of these unfortunate households uh, to be able to uh, have access to clean cooking technology. Lest we think this is a problem out there, which is the problem that most of us have when we think about uh, pollution, I'm sure most of us remember in the summer when the fires from uh, Canada brought real high levels of pollution to uh, the United States. I just focused on 
Um, uh, this particular day, there was a particular day that it was much, much higher. So lest we think it's a problem out there, we need to uh, start thinking seriously because everybody is at risk. And uh, lest you think we're insulated, this is the result of another study that was done in uh, six United States um, uh, cities. It's, the, it's called the Six City Harvard Study. This is, was published in 1993, where they followed uh, people from uh, Portage, Stobbenville, St. Louis for 14 years to look at life expectancy. And to put it in context, the PM 2.5 level in the most polluted uh, city, which is Steubenville, Ohio, uh, Ohio, was just about 40, much, much uh, lower than what I just showed you uh, when we had this problem in the summer. And what did they die of? Cardiovascular issues, lung cancer, whether you are a current smoker or former smoker. Uh, so I just uh, included this to um, uh, let you know that all of us are at risk. And uh, this is also work from the <laughs> Milton Friedman Center here, looking at potential gains in life expectancy in some of the 10 most populated countries that includes the United States. And you can look at India, average life expectancy gain, if only we can wrap our, uh, our hands around ensuring that people are not exposed to pollutant air. If you go to New Delhi, uh, daily PM uh, exposure level is in the 300, 400 range every day. Um, if you look at potential gains uh, based on all of this economic model, there is a lot we can do um, uh, collaboratively to change the trajectory of our lives of people who are less privileged than, than we are. And the same thing in Africa, where um, uh, a lot of the en energy poverty uh, continues to, to be an issue. Again, air pollution threat to health and the tools to combat it remain unequally distributed worldwide. Central and West Africa is a growing pollution hotbed. South Asia continues as global epidemic for pollution, and most Latin Americans are breathing air that exceed the WHO when, um, guidelines. So all of us are potentially at risk. I'm going to tease you with this uh, particular notion that being on the south side of Chicago is also just as bad as being in Nigeria. This was in 2018, where we actually, because of the ability for us to look at indoor exposure, we concurrently put um, indoor monitors in households in Woodlawn, Washington Park, Roseland, Allgate, um, uh, Austin and in Nigeria. And we, I think we did the same thing for Bangladesh. What I want to point your attention to is H3, which is Roseland. You know, even though they smoke, look at the level indoor exposure for PM 2.5, 1,500, even higher though than some of the households in Nigeria where people were cooking with. Uh, and you might wonder, why is the indoor air quality on the south side of Chicago, 153, 88, 110, 135, so bad? We live in a cold climate, and uh, poor people learn from their grandmothers that when it's cold and you have cold blast entering your household, you should turn on your gas range and uh, as a way to supplement heat. So a lot of our African-American colleagues, even though they work, and have access to the thermostat. When it gets cold, what do they do? They are turning on their gas range to supplement it. And if you look at the south side of Chicago, the maternal mortality rate and infant mortality rate is also one of the highest in the United States. So um, I just wanted to um, um, uh, use this as the pattern um, uh, slide to underscore that Global health is also local health, and anything that we've learned globally can be very applicable, even on the south side uh, of Chicago. In terms of strategies for the future, I have some of these parting questions for all of us. 
Will self-interest propel, propel us to engage meaningfully to protect ourselves from the predictable worsening of our environment and adverse consequences? Do we have a moral imperative to look out for the least privileged among us, even when they are so far away from us? And is there room for an environmental justice mindset to protect everyone, regardless of race, color, country of origin, or income? This kind of work uh, takes uh, a village. I have um, collaborators here at the University of Chicago. I want to thank Fumi, who convinced me to come to the University of Chicago to be part of developing the Global Health Program. It's a real outstanding colleagues from the University of Ibadan. This extensive list of young people and our colleague from uh, Michigan State uh, University. And um, uh, again, uh, this is I just want to thank all of them. And uh, uh, this is just um, um, uh, what the team looks like when we go to the field. Serious uh, looking people. I'll stop here and take um, any questions that you guys uh, might have. Stop sharing my screen. You are mute. So now I can't even unmute myself in person. Uh, so uh, it's that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I know that there uh, may be questions here. I'm going to start just by asking you one question, Shola, which is, you know, it seemed to me that the the research insights that showed that this exposure to particulate <clears throat> uh, pollution indoors had this impact on health and whatnot. Um, I'm just curious about, it seems to me that there was an additional, maybe you could tell us a little bit about once you identify there is this health issue, how do you then affect the policies locally to make the changes that happen? Um, because it seems like so frequently we see uh, there's a, a, a realization that there is a public health risk um, but then it seems like the change in policy takes decades before their substantive change, whereas it seemed like changes that you were showing us seemed to happen more rapidly. Yeah, that's a, uh, a great question, uh, Peter. Um, because this study was in Nigeria, um, and what people in Nigeria do is just what people all over the world do. Uh, so there is ongoing effort at the WHO level uh, to extend uh, some of these observations and the work that we we do to all of these uh, countries. Uh, but you have to understand that low, inc low to middle income countries, where the bottom billion people live, they have dysfunctional leadership. I guess I say that with uh, tongue in cheek because even here in the United States, I don't know that we are any better than them. Uh, but for Nigeria, especially where kerosene was being uh, subsidized, I made a strong effort to share some of this uh, report with some of my colleagues. Um, I mean, we played cricket together. They were commissioners to try and see whether they could influence policy to take away the subsidy on kerosene and make sure people don't cook with it anymore. There's still kerosene available. They're still cooking with it. Uh, in India, for example, they've done uh, a much better job. They have what they call this uh, Ujwala program, where they've decided to just go to some of these poor communities and replace their uh, firewood um, uh, with um, um, LPGs. Uh, they've done a fantastic job with this, but then they negate it because they have this... Uh, festival um, uh, of, of light where they burn everything and the PM levels again go above 1,000. So as they are trying to improve it, they have some of these traditions that make things. Um, um, but seriously, the Clean Cooking Alliance through the Niger I mean, United Nations, uh, they're creating uh, entrepreneurship around uh, clean cooking 
uh, to also have carbon credits available for households that actually adopt clean cooking technology, you get paid about $20 every year. And in settings where people are living on one to $2 a day, that's substantial. So there's ongoing effort to look at carbon trade uh, to create a small business uh, enterprise. That's why I'm actually quite excited with the new R01 that we have, uh, which is using an implementation science approach to distribute work with communities to let them adopt, make, look at willingness to, willingness to pay, willingness to adopt clean technology. But the challenges are still quite uh, high. And on our back side, um, I actually started uh, a similar project on the south side of Chicago uh, to actually look at, in, to replicate what we did in Nigeria. But then we ran into um, uh, COVID at that time because I was trying to just show on the south side of Chicago that the habit of turning on the gas rain during the summer, winter months, it's a major contributor and that would be very amenable to public service announcement. You know, because if, could, if we could show that some of these uh, adverse uh, bath outcomes are season locked in winter relative to summer, then we could just go and tell people we don't need to actually still do that now that people are sensitized that maybe the gas that we cook with inside has nitric um, uh, dioxide, even with our privilege. Everybody is worried about NO2 in gas. So the indoor environment is a very, very important uh, area of investigation that even those of us who are privileged now and have access to LPG, we're worried about the impact of NO2 on cognitive development and hypertension development and all of that. So yeah, we hope that policy and some of this, uh, in fact, the one that gets me the most, it's the trajectory of some of these young people. I mean, you grow up in, uh, uh, in a challenging household, poor um, uh, setting, uh, you grow, then you develop in a hypoxic state and cognitively you are behind. So they're not going to be economically great participants in the uh, uh, economy, but I'm hoping that at least uh, the pediatricians who know more than I do can do a lot more to rehab and, and make um, uh, some of these young people have more uh, fruitful and productive lives. Yes, Umi.
And I think it's a moral obligation in my mind that we cannot do ethical research at the University of Chicago without engaging our community. And I'm really grateful that the Urban Health Initiative, a lot of the work that the ITN is doing, all of us really thinking about all of us beyond the genetics. We're going to get the data, but beyond getting the data, we have to become socially active in our communities to change our communities. And I think as the University of Chicago, we have to change the world. So kudos to you for going to the WHO and putting it on the WHO agenda. It's really eye-opening when you go out and you see this. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Uh, so, uh, that, that was truly wonderful. Um, we're going to ask if you have just a few minutes um, to stick around uh, to talk with the fellows. Um, it'll sure. be a little bit different, but we'll see if we can get this to uh, to work. But thank you all for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you at future uh, noon conferences. Uh, happy to wait.